The book of Revelation is one big red herring for many. So I undertook this study to dispel the misunderstandings of it. And while through the grace of Yah, I have a fuller understanding of this book than I had going in, I also had my feet caught and stumbled a few times on this journey. So this video is first to correct the errors that I have recognized and second to fill in some blanks and create an extensive historic timeline of events. The judgments of Revelation open with the seven seals and Matthew 24 is pretty much a line by line playbook of them. I feel I did a pretty good job on these. So let's move on to the seven trumpets. The first four trumpets concern the siege of Galilee, which Josephus was in charge of. The first trumpet is hail and fire mingled with blood. And this relates to the taking of Sephoris in Wars Book 3, Chapter 4, Section 1. At the second trumpet, we see a great mountain burning with fire being cast into the sea. Now, originally, I thought that this was Jerusalem based on Matthew 21, where Yeshua tells his disciples that they would be able to cast a mountain into the sea. But I now believe that this is speaking of the taking of Mount Gerizim in Samaria in Wars Book 3, Chapter 7, Section 32. Although a similar scenario is presented in the taking of Tarake in Chapter 10, Section 1. It also says that a third of trees are burned up and all green grass is burned up. The trees being burned up relates to the overthrow of Jotapada in Wars Book 3, Chapter 7, Section 8 where it says that the trees were cut down by the Romans. And I believe that all green grass being burned up is a reference to famine. Now, we don't see this famine mentioned in Josephus' account as he relays that he had already stored up food for the war. However, he does mention a drought in section 12 of this chapter. At the third trumpet, a great star named Wormwood falls from heaven onto a third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters, and this star makes the waters bitter. This is referring to the taking of Joppa in Wars Book 3, Chapter 9, Sections 2 and 3, where the people move the fight from land to sea, causing their ships to be destroyed and the lake which they were fighting in to become bloody from the battle. This also continues with the battle on the Lake of Gennesaret in Wars Book 3, Chapter 10, Section 9. At the fourth trumpet, a third part of the sun, moon, and stars are smitten. Because of the reference to the sun, moon, and stars and the day and night becoming dark because of it, I believe that this is referring to the deaths of the martyrs who would be considered the light of the earth in God's eyes. But I also think that this could refer to the three horns being taken down by the land beast, as written in Daniel chapter 7. Now, after the fourth trumpet is sounded, an angel flies through the midst of heaven and says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And these three woes pertain to the taking of Jerusalem. At the fifth trumpet, an angel opens the bottomless pit and locusts come out of the pit. And these locusts are given the power to torment men for five months. Now, originally, I thought that this was referring to Titus's five month siege of Jerusalem, which began in 70 AD. But for one, this is too early in the woes of Jerusalem for this to be what this is talking about. And two, it says that those locusts had hair like the hair of women. And in Wars Book 4, Chapter 9, Section 7 through 10, John of Gascala's army is explicitly mentioned as having hair like the hair of women and also due to their effeminate appearances. Because of this, I believe that these locusts represent John of Gascala's army. At the sixth trumpet, the four angels bound in the Euphrates are loose. And after this, we see a 200 million man army. Now, this army is the heavenly army. And that army is offering support to the Roman army. So at this point, this is where I believe that Titus's siege of Jerusalem actually begins. Now, Titus's siege began shortly before Passover in 70 AD. And based on chapter 14, the 144,000 were first fruits. So I take this to mean that they were gathered 
on Shavuot of 70 AD. So next in chapter 14, we see the seven thunders. During the first thunder, the angel in heaven preaches the everlasting gospel, which is the two witnesses prophesying. Now, the two witnesses have been prophesying since the war began in 66 AD because their prophecy lasted for three and a half years. However, it is being explicitly mentioned here because of what happens at the second thunder, which is the two witnesses being killed. What follows that is the abomination of desolation being set up, which leads to the mark of the beast being enforced, which brings about the great tribulation. And after the great tribulation, the seventh trumpet is sounded and Yeshua comes in the cloud. The next three thunders are Yeshua reaping the olive harvest, which is the wheat from the parable of the wheat in Matthew 13. Next, we see an angel who is ready to reap. And while this angel is waiting to reap, we have the seven bowls. After the seven bowls are completed, the angel reaps the grape harvest who are the tares of the parable of the wheat in Matthew 13. And this happens at the destruction of the temple. Finally, we have the cup of God's wrath being poured out during the battle at Armageddon. And this is where Yeshua treads the wine press outside of the city. Not because it was actually done outside of Jerusalem, but because Jerusalem was outside of God's city of New Jerusalem. Next, we have the first resurrection, followed by the judgment of the nations, which occurs at the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the millennial reign, New Jerusalem descending, the final rebellion of Gog and Magog, followed by the general judgment, at which point New Jerusalem will be complete. And trying to establish a timeline for these future events will be the subject of my next study. So now that we've covered all of the events, let's move on to the dating of the book. The language in chapters 1 and 22 says that these things must shortly come to pass. And based on the context provided in Matthew 24, the last day's prophecies of Genesis 49 concerning the identifiable fulfillments of Dan, Benjamin, and Judah, the context of the prophecies in the book of Daniel, and the overall context of the scriptures in general, the book of Revelation concerns Israel and Jerusalem. The Ten Kings Having No Kingdom in chapter 17, when evaluated against the historical account of Josephus, who claims he was one of these kings, dates the book of Revelation pre-66 AD. The date is more specifically pinpointed in the identity of the seven heads and seven kings in chapter 17, which I will be going into in the fall. All of this, along with this entire series studying the book, encompass my argument for why the judgments are passed and were specific to Israel as laid out in Leviticus 26. The caveat to this though, is that in Deuteronomy 30, God said he would lay the curses of Deuteronomy 28 on those that hate Israel and persecuted them. But as of now, I am hard pressed to believe that that judgment will have the same severity as that of Israel due to the lack of covenant. Now there are some who date this book to 95 or 96 AD. And this is based on the interpretation of Rome as Babylon and Nero as the 666 man using alterations of his name to make it sum to 666 in Gematria. But John said the 666 is the number of a man, not the number of the name of a man. So this is a red herring, which I counter in chapter 13 by counting the 666 as the number of a man, like John said to. Doing it this way makes the result pretty irrefutable and closes the book on a future fulfillment, in my opinion. There are also traditions about John the Apostle being dunked in hot oil without harm and then being exiled to Patmos by Domitian and dying there, while others claim he died at Ephesus. But I counter this in chapter 11. Now, the people who believe this expect a future fulfillment of the judgments in Revelation based on a Christian perspective of the writings after Malachi, dubbed the New Testament. So let's evaluate some of the arguments for this. Revelation 17 is used to try to prove Rome as the harlot because she sits on seven hills. I have even seen someone using this coin of Rome reclining on seven hills to dispute the book of Revelation altogether and call it a failed prophecy. But the image on the obverse of this coin belongs to Vespasian, the same Vespasian who in 68 AD left his son Titus to finish the siege of Jerusalem that he had started so that he could go to Rome and become emperor in 69 AD. 
the year of four emperors. Now this coin, which is the only one of its kind, was minted in 71 AD, according to numismatists. What a coincidence. I guess this one here, displaying Vespasian holding a spear with his foot on a helmet, and a man sitting under a palm tree with the inscription Judea Capta, meaning Judea Capture, is coincidental as well, huh? Here's another of Titus from 79 AD, nine years after the defeat of Jerusalem, and six years after the war ended, and they are still celebrating. How long did they mint these coins? 25 whole years they celebrated conquering Israel. Even Agrippa joined in on the fun. It's almost enough to make you think that maybe Jerusalem actually was kind of a big deal. So let's go back to the seven hills. In Wars Book 5, Josephus describes at least six hills that Jerusalem sat on. Those are Citadel Hill or Mount Zion in the upper city, which is the city of David. Acre Hill, which was in the lower city. A third hill over against Acre. Bazitha Hill, on which the new city was built between the second and third walls. Antonia Hill, where the Antonia Fortress was built. And Mount Moriah, where the temple was built. He also tells us that three towers of Herod named Hippocus, which intersected the second and third walls, Faza Ellis and Mariamne were built on a hill, but he doesn't specify which hill. Now, if this hill is a different hill from Mount Zion, that would make seven hills that Jerusalem sits on. So in all likelihood, Jerusalem also has seven hills. Yet still, surely Rome is Babylon because Rome persecuted the church. But whose church? Yeshua made it abundantly clear in chapter 2 that there were two churches, his and the one belonging to Jezebel. And persecution of Jezebel's church does not equal martyrdom. The true prophets and saints were all persecuted in Jerusalem. Let's put aside the fact that Yeshua, a Jew's revelation to John, also a Jew, beginning with the destruction of Rome and ending with the completion of of not new Rome, but new Jerusalem is illogical. God foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and scattering of Israel due to their persecution of the righteous and the prophets all throughout the Old Testament. Yeshua confirmed this in Matthew 24 when he specifically foretold the destruction of the temple and the book of Revelation details it. And there is not a doubt in my mind that the writer of the book intended it to be interpreted as the fulfillment of those prophecies because it was written in such a way that those who actually read and understand the writings before Malachi will be forced to see the fall of Jerusalem in it, while those who do not will be blind to it. This is especially the case with chapters 17 and 18, if you know the prophets. So if it was written in 96 AD, then it is a historical book posing as prophecy. That is most likely pseudepigraphal in my view based on my understanding of chapter 11. Red herring such as this is why it is of the utmost importance to keep God's perspective in the forefront of your mind when reading his word rather than trying to read your own personal beliefs and circumstances into it. But in order to do that, you have to first understand God's perspective. The entire Bible is basically God's diary detailing the birth of one specific nation and the ups and downs of his relationship with that nation, including ending one covenant with them while simultaneously establishing another. And the book of Revelation is written from the perspective of Vespasian and Titus being God's servants, just as Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant when he carried that same nation off to Babylon. This is why some of the actions performed by angels from the heavenly perspective are fulfilled by Rome on the earth. And this is most evident in the first four trumpets and the sixth trumpet. So what's more likely than Rome being Babylon, which is absolutely not the case, is Rome being God's instrument against the children of Jezebel, who ironically are the grandchildren of Babylon, who Yeshua said he would kill with death. The 12 apostles and those they instructed were not modern day Christians. They were Jews. And as they are condescendingly called Judaizers who believed Yeshua was their Messiah. To try to substitute Christianity into the story, particularly as the saints, is erroneous because Daniel said the kingdom would not be left to another people. And Christianity, by and large, is another people because Christianity does not follow what Yeshua taught. 
And if you are among the millions who just like the wicked children of Babylon, whom Yeshua called workers of iniquity and whom he destroyed, have written off God's law, but have still sealed yourself up in a quote unquote spiritual temple, expecting him to save you, then you are among her children also. And you are in for a similar rude awakening if you don't open your eyes and take a closer look at what the scriptures actually teach and repent. For the kingdom of God is truly at hand. Thank you for joining me. Feel free to drop any comments, concerns, agreements, or disagreements in the comment section below. I hope that this study has blessed you and inspired you to search further into Yah's word. May Yahuwah bless you and keep you. May Yahuwah shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.